right, so the topic of today, um, we're going to have two topics. Uh, one, just kind of a general overview of digital imaging. And uh, another, um, talking about dimensional referencing. And then we'll uh, start throwing in some exercises and uh, so you guys can kind of practice uh, working with dimensional references. And I tend to kind of mix that in the optical microscopy, but it's used with any kind of microscopy. And uh, so we'll start getting into actually using um, dimensional referencing. Uh, I talk about digital imaging uh, just a little bit anyway. And um, the reason I do that is because uh, back in my day, um, we didn't really use digital imaging. And uh, so uh, my micrographs, um, at least up until my thesis, were all made from film photography. And uh, we had to develop the images by hand. And it was kind of a tedious process. And uh, the film is very expensive. And uh, so nowadays, you can go sit on an SEM, take a billion pictures. You know, maybe not a billion, but you can get into the double digits very fast. And um, um, back in the day, you really couldn't do that. It was too expensive and too time consuming uh, to do that kind of thing. Um, kind of in the spirit of things, you know, I show a micrograph here. Uh, it's pretty, should be pretty obvious uh, what this is, um, even if, if, if this is your first microscopy class. Um, this is a, obviously an SEM image. Um, I have some, um, oh, let me get the laser pointer going. Sorry, I cut myself off. Uh, we have kind of the information uh, that the instrument gives us, and we'll learn about more uh, what this stuff means. Um, I'll kind of start saying this now. This uh, 1.8 thousand times is kind of useless. Uh, what is useless is the dimensional reference, which is the second topic of uh, today's uh, lecture. Um, but this is a scanning electron micrograph. Uh, this was of um, a water filter uh, from a water treatment plant. And uh, this uh, looks like some sort of microbe, uh, microbial animal. And uh, I always ask, um, you know, what could make this micrograph better, more useful? And um, the contrast is actually pretty good. So uh, kind of bringing back up old topics that we've talked about at the very beginning of class, um, kind of interpreting the difference between black and white really um, is uh, part of a materials characterization, as well as, as determining lines on a screen. And I kind of uh, didn't harp on that enough when uh, we talked about XPS and uh, AES. Um, but what can make this micrograph better? Well, we have a dimensional reference but we're not told uh, what this uh, distance corresponds to. And uh, this is off uh, Hitachi scanning electron microscope. And uh, I, I believe nearly every, um, with the exception of the tabletop Hitachi SEM, uh, gives this kind of a bar at the bottom. And uh, from here to here um, is your dimensional reference and or the total length uh, that the number that's usually here corresponds to. So a number telling us uh, what this distance means uh, would make this a lot more useful. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of a pretty picture, and it's actually kind of a neat picture, a little grainy perhaps, but it's, it's uh, pretty neat. So digital imaging, um, I kind of have the matrix here. And uh, so machine language 10110011, I don't know what that means, um, but anyway, my homage to uh, machine language, digital imaging. Um, I talk about it. It's very important uh, when we do the work we do. And sometimes it's difficult to use the machines. And you have to uh, you know, document your work, whether it's your research or whether it's something uh, you're doing for a job, whether it's failure analysis or whatever. You want to preserve the image. And uh, the old way was emulsion photography. And uh, this is a blast from uh, my past. And uh, I used to do a lot of work with hypervelocity impacts. And uh, some people look at the impactors. I was looking at impact craters. And uh, sometimes I talk about it a little bit more in class, particularly when we talk about TEM. Uh, this here actually is a transmission electron micrograph. Um, sometimes I go over this on the first day of class. And um, what is this? What are these bars? 
Uh, well, these bars are, are deformation twins. Um, this came from copper, you know, pretty much pure copper, and uh, it was impacted with a tungsten carbide projectile, um, traveling at, at uh, hypervelocity speeds, actually. Um, you can tell it's old. Um, this is a handmade micron marker, and uh, we'll talk about how to make micron markers of, um, on the dimensional referencing portion of this lecture. Uh, so this is um, a real space image, and we'll get into these terms uh, later on in the semester in a lot more intimate detail. But uh, this here is a real space image, so we actually see our twins. Um, how do we know they're twins? Well, the reciprocal space information, and this is a diffraction pattern, uh, tells us it's twins because we have two spots. And this could be some other type of fault, um, some other type of stacking fault, perhaps. And, uh, but we know it's a twin uh, because if I draw a line through these two dots and intersect, if I kept going, if I intersect, you get roughly 90 degrees. So your diffraction pattern, the spots from your diffraction pattern um, used in conjunction with uh, your, your um, bright field image uh, actually can tell you if it's a twin. Uh, this was made with emulsion photography. Um, I took a negative. Uh, did the whole negative thing like uh, this cartoon is doing, used chemicals, that kind of thing, and uh, projected the image onto a piece of paper. And uh, not just notebook paper, but photographic paper and um, dark rooms. So we still have the dark rooms in our uh, department, but they're not necessarily used as dark rooms anymore. And uh, um, maybe I can give you guys a tour or something sometime. But emulsion photography was the old way. Uh, here's an example of the old way, and I actually think the contrast is, is pretty good. If I do say so myself, I was a much younger uh, person when I made that. Um, the new way is uh, electronic imaging sensors, basically. And there's two flavors, and CCDs are still used. Um, our transmission electron microscope on the second floor still uses a CCD, a charge coupled device. Uh, the other flavor is a CMOS image sensor, and the CMOS image sensor is uh, what I'm using to record this lecture. Uh, this camera on my tablet here is a CMOS image sensor. Um, the, I guess, three cameras on the back of my phone are also all CMOS image sensors. Um, CMOS image sensors and CCDs um, were developed by AT&T. Uh, the old American Telegraph and Telephone Company. Um, now, I guess they're kind of a cell company. Uh, but they used to have, uh, they used to be Bell Labs. Um, and uh, what's the other one? They became Lucent. And I have a, a kind of a, not necessarily a timeline, but the names of the companies in the subsequent slide. I, I'm kind of jumping ahead. But anyway, the, the purpose of digital imaging um, is to preserve our image. And uh, that's what it's all about. Um, when we're doing uh, any kind of microscopy, whether it's electron microscopy, optical microscopy, um, you name it, there's different flavors of microscopy. Um, the old way, and uh, I really hate it when it does this, I make my slides on another computer and I bring it to this one, it changes the font, so I'm sorry if uh, this is, is, is hard to read. Um, the old way, photosensitive silver film uh, the grain size, so there's actually literally grains of silver particles on the film, and that determined the resolution. And uh, the bigger grains, okay, was more light captured per grain. And so bigger grains is equivalent to bigger pixels, so it's lower resolution. And uh, so the so-called fast film um, was ISO 400 plus. And I remember, you know, distinctly going to the store as a kid and uh, you'd have ISO numbers bigger than 400, and it doubles. So you had 400, 800, 1600, 3200, and uh, you know the higher speed films are like for sports pitchers, you know, like a kid running or or somebody playing soccer or something like that. But it is lower resolution, and uh, smaller grains is uh, less light captured per grain, and uh, that's the so-called slow film. And so you get higher resolution. So if you're taking stills of uh, scenery or pictures of a flower or something, you could use ISO 200, 150. Um, so those are the three uh, slower ISOs. Um, better resolution, less light captured per grain. So you would have a longer exposure time. 
and uh, so you'd actually get enough light to actually cause your uh, chemical reaction on your film. Um, when I was in school as an undergrad, we used to have to do exposure tests. And so I remember uh, very distinctly Dr. Varma would give us um, some film and uh, the optical microscope actually had a, a light camera system on it. And uh, we, were, we would um, do it iteratively on the same piece of film. So it was like a Polaroid film. And uh, I kind of trying to use my words in the hand to explain it, but I'm kind of going down memory lane in this lecture. So I apologize for my digression. Um, again, the old way kind of reiterating ISO film speed. Um, it was also called ASA. And I want to say that was like the American Standards Association, if I'm not mistaken. Um, ISO is International Standards Organization. And uh, so you actually even had a 3200 speed film. I didn't put that on this one, but fast and slow. Uh, I don't think there is anything lower than 50. Um, but when an ISO number is doubled, you need half as much light to create an image is kind of the rule of thumb. Why do I even bother talking about this is uh, maybe a question you guys have. Um, digital photography has uh, kind of come a long way and I need to check my own camera app. But even to this day, some camera apps have uh, ISO settings and uh, I, I don't want to fiddle around with this too, too much. Uh, but you digital cameras, a lot of it, other than the fancy filters and stuff like that, are, are generally made to mimic um, old school film cameras. And uh, so you have uh, ISO um, values on some camera models, not all. And I had a phone app at one time that let me change the ISO as well. Um, so you could kind of mimic and it's uh, you're, you're getting your image sensor to act like film and um, which is basically what you're doing. So I still kind of talk about it when to pay homage, uh, but another because some of this stuff still is on your um, phones, phone cameras even. And uh, if we go buy a digital camera, I don't have it in my office right now, but I have this Canon uh, that's not that old actually that has ISO uh, settings and stuff like that. So instead of Googling it, you can watch this lecture. Um, general principles of uh, digital imaging. Um, so the whole thing you want to do is uh, you're trying to convert light into electrons, basically. So you're converting light into an electronic signal. How do we do this? Well, there's two devices that allow us to do this. Um, a CMOS image sensor. So CMOS is complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So you have transistors that are P-type and transistors that are N-type. Uh, and by that, I mean the wells. So uh, the well is either P or, or um, N-type. Um, if you had me for electronic materials, hopefully you remember me talking about it. If you didn't and you want to know more, you can come talk to me. Um, CCD's charge coupled device, so it's slightly different. And I'm realizing I'm not going, maybe not going into enough detail about the differences between the devices themselves. And I might kind of come back to this. Uh, but CMOS um, image sensor, very common now, very easy to make. Um, CCD charge couple devices, not quite as easy to make. And, and now they're not even common. They've, they've really been displaced in a lot of ways by the CMOS image sensor. Um, but AT&T developed it. Um, they became Bell Labs and they became Lucent and they became a gear. And um, Bell Labs was very famous for a while. And, and when I was a young lad just graduating, Lucent was a big one and I don't know what happened to them, but then they became a gear and then they became nothing. Um, I think LSI Technologies bought all of their patents or something, but anyway, again, memory lane. Um, this is, I don't like this schematic very much about the optical microscope, um, but you have, and, and this is actually kind of confusing to me. But um, if you think about it, you have your objective lens here, then you would have your eyepiece. And then here, this is depicting some sort of fancy optic system where your illumination system um, is going here and bouncing off. But you would have your objective lens. You would have what you're looking at. Your objective lens has a focal point, OK? And so the focal point of your objective lens is where your imaging plane would be. And uh, you have. 
um, you know, some other fancy optics here in your eyepiece so you can see it with your eye. Uh, there's other imaging systems where you can actually take out the eyepiece and put in a camera. So your imaging system could also be here. Uh, but if you're using a machine or an optical microscope with an imaging system it, that you can use at the same time you're using the, the Binox, um, it's usually here is uh, kind of the point of this. And uh, hopefully this isn't too confusing and hopefully it's actually useful. Um, new way image sensor and uh, I, I have a debate with my photography friends and the crossover happened so long ago but um, anyway um, old VGA so I think up until maybe well yeah I guess now time flies 10 years ago I, I was still watching stuff in 640 by 480 um, and then I had an HD TV that was actually a cathode ray tube TV. So it was like this heavy, big, giant thing. And the price of TVs has got, come down. But the resolution, the terminology is, is quite the same. So a one megapixel is uh, 1216 by 912 pixels on a sensor, basically, is one megapixel. And uh, how does it compare to photographic resolution? Well, it's been said and debated by me and my friends that seven megapixels was like the crossover between the resolution of a 35 millimeter camera with film and uh, a digital camera. And someone told me I was dead wrong and then I like pulled it out of a photography magazine or something. But I say the, the crossover happened at seven megapixels. Um, I don't have a very expensive phone, but it has a 48 megapixel camera. So uh, the downside is a lot of noise. Um, occurs and um, when you increase your megapixelage and I want to say the original Mars rovers and you have like these striking images of Mars but I want to say the original Mars rovers were like one megapixel cameras and uh, you still got these striking images um, why because they were big sensors and they got a lot of light and that kind of thing so pixels the amount of pixels isn't the end all beat all for good resolution um, is kind of what I'm trying to say. Uh, but one megapixel is 1216 by uh, 912. And um, a lot of the uh, electron microscopes put out like two megapixel pictures. So um, still getting good stuff for your thesis and dissertations and papers and that kind of thing. But we're not at this mega resolution. Uh, people have higher resolution images of themselves on Instagram. It's kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, image sensor, pretty much an array of pixels, and uh, and um, I have a lot of pixels on my little phone camera. Uh, photoelectric effects. So I usually ask a, a question, and uh, you know how how do image sensors work? And they essentially work uh, based upon the photoelectric effect. Um, it's what Einstein won the Nobel Prize for. And uh, it's how solar cells work. Um, and it's also the basis for uh, how image sensors work. And um, this is a depiction, and I actually don't remember where I got it, of uh, Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect experiment. And uh, he shines some light here on a, on a metal, basically. And um, it emitted electrons, and they hit this anode, and then you read a voltage. And uh, if you remember, and I talked about it um, a little bit in the uh, AES XPS lecture, um, work function is uh, basically how much energy you have to put into a material to uh, get it to release its electrons. And if the light has the critical frequency, okay, and because if you remember, um, energy equals Planck's constant times frequency, and we'll see these equations on the, as uh, these slides progress. Um, if you have the critical threshold frequency, um, you'll start emitting electrons. And so that's the photoelectric effect. And uh, it's an eight megapixel camera Sprint. So this slide's a little old because um, Sprint is of course merged with T-Mobile. Um, but Einstein, uh, here's him figuring out the photoelectric effect. Okay, I'm just making that up. He's like drawing my fence or something. Um, so we have our equations here. I won't spend too, too much time on them. 
Um, I've gone over this pretty extensively in other classes, and I'm, I'm guessing, especially this being a grad class, you guys have seen this elsewhere. Uh, but the biggest equation uh, we care about, and this is actually very similar uh, to the equation we saw yesterday for the photoelectron um, X XPS uh, characterization. And so the kinetic energy of the emitted electron is equal to Planck's constant times the threshold frequency of the light uh, minus the work function of the material. So you can figure out the work function of material if you can figure out the kinetic energy of the emitted electron, basically. Because you'll know the frequency of your light, Planck's constant is a, is a constant. Um, what I always thought was cool, I mean, Einstein won uh, the Nobel Prize for this for what's essentially a linear equation. Uh, the work function is always the y-intercept of, uh, of um, this equation, basically. And so you can plot E of the emitted electron um, versus the threshold frequency of light. So you can have different light frequencies until you uh, start seeing a current on your experimental setup. And uh, anyway, work function. I'm probably spending a little too much time on this photoelectric effect. Um, you can read about it. I got this off of the uh, Nobel Prize. There's like a web page about Nobel Prizes. Uh, 1921. Uh, for his law of the uh, discovery of the photoelectric effect. Pretty cool. Um, charge couple device. So here's my painstakingly drawn um, cartoon of a charge coupled device. So you have an array. Um, a charge is created on this array uh, by the photon. Um, that charge is, con is uh, converted into a voltage, basically, and uh, you end up getting a, a signal. Um, the biggest part about CCD, so there's differences between CCD and CMOS image sensors, okay? The biggest difference between a CCD and a CMOS image sensor is that the uh, signal processing happens off of the sensor on a CCD. So the CCD, the entire sensor array is dedicated to collecting light. On a CMOS image sensor, um, only about a third or a quarter of the pixel is um, dedicated to collecting the light. And here we go. I'll go back to my experiment. Um, only, uh, okay, here I have it depicted as a quarter. So about a quarter of the entire pixel is um, dedicated to collecting the light. And the rest is support transistors. Okay, so these support transistors are what's converting um, the electronic signal to something that you can read and translate into an image. On a, on a CCD, that happens elsewhere. So all the signal processing happens off of the sensor. And so for the longest time, CCDs were better because they actually had light, better light capturing ability. Um, nowadays, the technology of, of CMOS um, had, has gotten better. Uh, mostly for the because of the advancement of semiconductor processing so they're on par or even better than ccds and to kind of prove that i did a, a experiment so i had an old ccd cannon and then i had a newer uh, cmos image sensor cannon and uh, they crossed over in terms of equivalent resolution at two megapixels and uh, so this is the ccd and this is the um, cmos image sensor and to me, they both look pretty clear. So these are my um, toys for my children, and they've actually kind of outgrown them a little bit. So this is a little bit older picture. Um, if you zoom in, you even kind of get a similar kind of noise uh, profile and kind of this dithering uh, where the camera can't differentiate uh, between uh, discrete shades of white. And uh, you see that on uh, inexpensive TVs versus nice TVs, the dithering. And so if you look at like dark scenes and you see like distinct, um, almost uh, plateaus of color, usually black or white, um, that's dithering. And so that kind of is what separates an inexpensive TV from uh, an expensive TV. Um, anyway, bare filter. Um, bare filter, if you look at it, the, the primary color is green. And uh, that color is there uh, to actually mimic the human eye. Uh, because we actually see in green. And um, so the bare filter is there uh, to, to mimic the human eye. It's, it's uh, um, when you're taking pictures, it's optical. 
And uh, so, especially on your phone and stuff like that, you want to see how your eye sees, basically. It's kind of cool. Um, resolution. So that's uh, one thing that people often get confused. And, and we'll come back and talk about this slide a lot more when we talk about optical microscopy. And uh, I was kind of recycling the slide, and maybe I shouldn't have. Um, so just kind of look at it. But the pixel size must be uh, smaller than the resolution of the projected image is, is uh, basically what I'm trying to get at. So that's not really a problem for a lot of these sensors now. Um, but if your pixel size is bigger than what you're trying to look at optically, um, you're not going to be able to see it, basically, is, is, is what I'm trying to say here. And uh, we won't talk about this too, too much. Well, I'm going to talk about this a lot more when we get to optical microscopy. Um, but the thing that you need to understand is that there's a difference between resolution and magnification. And magnification would be if I take a picture of myself and I blow it up and put it on the side of the Empire State Building, you'll see this big giant picture of me, but you're not going to know anything else, um, I guess, materials characterization E, okay? Uh, you won't be able to see the fine threads of my uh, shirt and stuff like that if you just take a picture of me and blow it up, okay? Um, the definition of resolution is the ability to distinguish two points, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit more uh, later. Um, image filtering, and uh, I don't know if I can draw. Let me. Well, let me do this. Okay. All right, image filtering. Um, an example of image filtering uh, would be like this. So I have very, very crude, uh, a very, very crude example. But if let's just say we have an array of pixels. Oopsie. That was very strange. And we get intensity values, OK? And uh, so let's just say we get like 1, 10, 2, 15, 50, 65, 1, 2, 7, 8. I'm just kind of making these numbers up. And uh, let's just say, um, you know, this is actually kind of a big difference. So this is going to be a really, really bright area. Maybe it's too bright. Maybe it shows up too white. Um, you want to put in some sort of filter. And there's very, very complex algorithms. Um, I actually got into this a lot uh, when I worked in the semiconductor industry because I did a lot of microscopy there. And I worked with a lot of instruments. And I can tell a lot of other stories, and I won't do that now. Um, but let's just say you, you want to filter this row of pixels. And so every, um, every row here uh, will give you pixel values, basically. So let's just say a nearest neighbor filter. And so um, here, this guy has no neighbor, so it's still one. And then there's separate filters for edge and stuff like that. There's edge filters. And that's why GPUs are the image processing chip on your camera is so important. And um, so nearest neighbor filter, um, you, you would average it. 
So 1 plus 10 divided by 2, and I'm almost embarrassed, so it's 11 divided by 2. But let's see what we get. Oops, you can probably hear me calculating. Okay, 5.5. .5. And um, 10 plus 2 divided by 2. Is 2.75, so 1, 5.5, and then 2 plus 15 divided by 2, 9.5, and then 15 plus 50 divided by 2 is 40, and um, 50 plus 65 divided by 2 I think I made a math mistake so 57.5 and then 65 is 33 and then um, how many do I have? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have three more to go. And one plus two divided by two is two. Two plus seven divided by two is four point five. And seven plus eight divided by two, eleven. All right, so now we have kind of a smoother line, right? We don't have like as drastic of jumps. So we went from one to ten. Here we went from one to five point five down to two point seven five. So the differences are are different. So we've um, effectively smoothed it. So we've lowered the 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 noise. So there's a nearest neighbor filter. This is just a common one. And um, this type of thing, there's much more complex uh, algorithms. Um, there's edge filters that have their own algorithms. Um, edge filters oftentimes uh, divide by the median or something like that. Um, so many algorithms. But anyway, image filtering, it's just a game of numbers, uh, basically. And hopefully this makes sense. And, and I kind of mumbled and stuff. But you do something to the filters. Uh, sometimes you can normalize it. So there's normalizing filters. And uh, so normalizing, um, you can like divide each pixel by the median. Uh, that kind of thing. So sorry, this is so sloppy, but image filtering, it's actually a big, big deal. And uh, some like fancy digital cameras are actually sold. And uh, I know Canon again, I'm harping on Canon a lot tonight, uh, but they, uh, they would always advertise like their Digix image processor. And it's because it has to process a large amount of calculations like this. Um, and this, these are very simple, uh, but anyway, image filtering, hopefully this gives you an idea of uh, what image filtering actually is and does. Um, CCD versus CMOS. And uh, so CCD is generally more power consumption. Um, it's, it's it, in the past, especially it's been less noisy and it's, it's more durable. Um, it consumes a lot of power, uh, which is why CMOS image sensors found their way to uh, like cell phones. And actually the cell phone industry drove the development, I believe. And uh, because it wasn't, um, long until you started finding uh, CCDs, I'm sorry, CMOS image sensors on digital SLRs. And uh, so it used to be CCDs would, would be on the uh, expensive cameras and now expensive cameras have CMOS image sensors. And uh, I took a trip to the McDonald Observatory 
And uh, the imaging sensor on their telescope is also a CMOS image sensor. And, uh, but they are cheap. Um, they're kind of all over the place. Like every spy camera, um, webcam, whatever has a, has a CMOS image sensor. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of background information on uh, the two sensor types. Um, image handling. So this is kind of my uh, um, kind of tips. So don't compress images. Uh, a lot of publications prefer TIFF, and I think now they're kind of taking more JPEG. And JPEG and TIFF are actually very, very old image formats. I, I'm kind of surprised um, no one's come up with a newer one. Uh, but I prefer TIFF myself, and um, our equipment saves in JPEG, but I think uh, I just learned how to, how to change that. So you can actually pick the output of our equipment, uh, particularly the SEMS, uh, to save as either TIFF or JPEG. And it actually is a good idea to be uh, savvy with photographic software. And because uh, particularly for publications, um, they want a specific resolution or uh, pixels per inch. And uh, so I, I'll talk about very briefly about some softwares that I use or software packages I use, um, ethics and image manipulation. And uh, so, yeah, you don't want to go use PowerPoint and add microstructural features that aren't there. That's bad, that's blatantly dishonest. Um, there are some people that say you should not change the uh, brightness and contrast of your image because that changes things. And that's where it gets a little uh, um, sketchy for me um, because when we were, when I was a young lad, okay, I told you we developed these images, okay? And uh, I won't go all the way back to the TM micrograph, uh, but I mean, we were taught to develop and you'd wave your hands to try to even out the contrast of your image. And am I altering the scientific interpretation of that um, micrograph? I don't think so. And so, um, okay, so yeah, I'm not going to go add something that isn't there, but I don't necessarily think messing around with the brightness and contrast is bad. Um, but it's up to you, um, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, I, I just have my own opinion based on how long I've been in this game, actually. So... Um, but always be ethical, always do, you know, the right thing. But I honestly don't think messing with brightness and contrast is bad. Um, anyway, uh, dimensional reference. Um, give me a sec. Dimensional reference and um, kind of my pet peeves are when people show pictures of stuff and uh, don't have dimensional references, particularly in scientific journals. And uh, dimensional reference is extremely important. And uh, this is kind of uh, in the vein of manipulating image a little bit, right? So um, this woman's obviously not holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, but it also doesn't give you uh, an idea of how big the Leaning Tower actually is. And uh, they used to let you climb on it, but now I think it's gotten too dangerous. Uh, but anyway, dimensional reference. Um, what's a dimensional reference? What is it used for? Uh, what are good dimensional references and calculation of dimensional reference? And uh, I'm going to start building in some uh, exercises in the coming uh, lectures um, or weeks, actually, as part of the curriculum to, so you guys get a, a better handle of it. Um, it's actually pretty simple and, uh, and they're very, very important. And if you get them wrong, it can mess a lot of things up. Uh, but what is a dimensional reference? What is it used for? And what are good dimensional references? And then a calculation of dimensional reference. Um, so helps you determine. So dimensional references help you determine a size relative scale. That's very, very important. Um, I'm actually embarrassed. So I show this as, so you all can learn from my mistakes. And this is a horrible example of a uh, dimensional reference. And um, it got published. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised no one ever said anything. And uh, there's a story behind this publication, uh, but it's a failure analysis uh, paper and uh, it's, it was published. Uh, I mean, I, I can go Google it and Google Scholar or whatever, look it up and, and relive the shame. Uh, but uh, you can still kind of tell how big these objects are. And so this is, uh, it says millimeters here pertain to the little lines. So this is one centimeter. And so these things are less than a centimeter wide. And, I, and they were failing, and so I did failure analysis of uh, the tip part here and uh, labeled them one, two, three, and I probably should not have used a permanent label. I should have put tape or something. But anyway, um, Journal of Failure Analysis and Prevention way back in 2010. Um, anyway, 
Learn from my mistakes. Don't use poopy rulers. Uh, what is the grain size? And uh, so this dimensional reference, and again, uh, blast from the past 2009 micrograph. Um, I think this is a very similar, it's part of the same set that I used earlier. Um, this is, uh, again, centering of silver. That's kind of cool. And uh, you see the solid state uh, grain growth signs. So these are, are growth, growth ridges. And you also see it if you uh, center ceramics. So, you know, if I didn't tell you it was silver and you said ceramics, uh, you, you know, you'd be wrong, but you wouldn't be blamed for it because it looks very, very similar. Um, this is useless. So this 3.5 thousand X is, is useless because I can stretch this picture. Hopefully we preserve the aspect ratio so we don't skew it, right? That's another kind of image manipulation thing. Uh, but this line, if you've scaled your picture uniformly, uh, this line will always be equal to 10 microns, okay? And then you can figure out the grain size of this. So you could use the linear intercept method so I could draw a line and um, let me get the pen. And I'm not going to be able to draw it straight, though. Or if I do shift, can I do it? Hold on. Ah, uh, all right, sorry. I'm gonna do it very crudely and I'm not editing editing this out. So I can, I can learn from my mistakes. Oh, oh, maybe I should edit it out. Oh my gosh, eraser, you're letting me down. That's very strange. Okay, so linear intercept. Straight lines. Okay. I would use a ruler if I'm doing it by hand. Um, I'm using a pen, a power of surface pen. And then this is hard. This is a void. So we don't want to count that as a grain size, a grain counter. And. I'm going to do a more complete video for doing this. Um, you could use linear intercept method. Um, this corresponds to 10 microns. So I could measure this, compare it with the length of this, and count the intercepts. Um, we'll go over this in a little bit greater detail. But anyway, you can use the linear intercept method and compare the length of the measured diameters to the dimensional reference or else you wouldn't be able to figure out how big these grains were. So it's it's kind of a, a big deal. Um, same magnification, so you can actually make comparisons. So now we've, we know that this is all the same magnification because our dimensional references are all the same. And uh, so we can kind of see, and this is back in my days of working with conductive ink and uh, comparing the particle, not only the morphology, but the relative particle size. Um, so this uh, brand here, had a uh, um, much smaller uh, particle size than these others. But we can actually say this, and it's still a little qualitative, okay, because I'm not actually, I don't actually have measurements here. But just by looking at it, you can kind of tell, you know, this is smaller. This has kind of bigger chunks, like here and here and here. And uh, these are giant flakes. And uh, relatively, this has the biggest. And I would say this one's the smallest. And we can see if I'm proven wrong, um, because I actually did a real analysis based on these sim images and uh, created a size di distribution histogram. And uh, what's funny is I don't have it. I just realized just, just now, I don't have it in the same order. Oh my gosh. Um, well, anyway, side grain or size, I got a mean, let's just say this five here. And so this is a 1660. And so this is 1660, so five microns. Um, oops, 3309F, I was about 0.6 microns. And so said that was the smallest. So I could kind of tell this by looking at it. Um, the CBO28 um, was, oh, well, okay. I guess it's okay that it's not the same. I just realized this is a different ink. This is a nanoparticle ink. Uh, but did some manual SEM measurements of even nanoparticle leak, and I had a mean of about 35 nanometers, man. 
So again, very powerful. So measurements can be used to characterize what you're looking at. I apologize for not having the same pictures of this as well as the histogram. I just kind of figured out I must have made a mistake but, and don't want to go dig it up. Uh, but anyway, hopefully you get the idea um, of how powerful you know a dimensional reference can be because uh, you can make some real quantitative analysis of your stuff uh, just based on the dimensional reference. Um, I typically make my own micron markers, especially to publish. And I, I admit this now, I use PowerPoint and I've kind of migrated to another software called ImageJ, uh, but a PowerPoint still is pretty uh, useful um, because you can measure uh, the line. And so basically what I would do in PowerPoint is I would draw a line from here to here and measure it. So it'll tell me um, how big it is. So let's just say this was 1.34 inches and if I wanted to make a micron marker that said 10 microns instead of 20, um, I would cut that in half. So I would make uh, the micron marker um, 1.34 divided by 2. I would make it 0.67. So this means 0 0.67 inches equals 10 microns, um, that kind of thing. Okay. So PowerPoint, to make micron markers, uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread in my opinion, I, I, I've said this before, PowerPoint is uh, the finest image manipulation software available to society. And uh, you can laugh at me and tell me I'm wrong all you want. Um, I've been using it to make videos too, so now I think it's the finest video editing software uh, known to society as well. Um, am I joking? I don't know. But um, other uh, software is uh, that's actually really good and it's free. Um, that you can use to this for this type of stuff, uh, GIMP. So the GNU image manipulation program is totally awesome. Um, I use it to scale my images. I use it to uh, meet publication requirements for image resolution um, in terms of, uh, of PPI, pixels per inch. Um, image J, um, I think I need to put something together for Image J, at least for uh, making micron markers uh, with Image J. And uh, so be on the lookout for that. And uh, I apologize for not putting it into this lecture, but I'll, I'll put it in a, a later lecture. Um, I, I provide the PowerPoints to these lectures in Blackboard. And so you can click on the link in, in the, in the uh, PowerPoint lecture, or you can um, just Google ImageJ. It's pretty common. Uh, it was made by the National Institute of Health. And you can do a lot of powerful, powerful things with it. And I see a lot of people using it, and there's a lot of savvy people and uh, people, um, if you have, you can use contrast. So if, if you have particles in your in a matrix that are white, you can figure out the relative dense or relative uh, volume fraction of particles uh, by carrying by comparing light and dark pixels with it. Um, you, again, you can use it to make your own micro markers. Probably better than PowerPoint, but PowerPoint's uh, kind of what I've used for a while. Uh, paint, I didn't use paint an awful lot, and uh, I've actually used it in published works. And uh, the old school paint app, um, what I like about it is that you can uh, save it in TIFF. So you can import stuff into paint, manipulate it, export it as a TIFF. And then a Windows snipping tool is also very important. So it's migrating the snip and sketch. Uh, and, and kind of one thing, uh, so I really appreciate snipping tool and that kind of thing, because in the old days, you'd have to go get a third party software to do screen capture or a localized screen capture. Um, or you could just, you know, control print screen and uh, import that into paint and crop it or whatever. Uh, but anyway, these are just kind of my tidbits. Um, I've been using these these kind of techniques for a very, very long time. They've actually worked for me and they're simple. And uh, don't laugh, this is actually uh, something I do. And I trust it um, pretty, pretty much, actually. Um, okay. I should have had this as my beginning image. Uh, what instrument made this? And uh, this is actually an optical micrograph. So we've seen three types of micrographs. Uh, in this lecture alone, we've seen a scanning electron micrograph, several actually, um, a TEM micrograph, so transmission electron micrograph. And uh, now we're seeing an optical micrograph. Uh, I believe this is additively manufactured cobalt chromoly uh, that a colleague of mine was working with uh, back in the day. Um, so if you know the magnification 
Okay, if you know the magnification, a um, one centimeter line, okay, will equal um, one over mag times 10 to the fourth microns. Okay, so I'm going to draw it as close to scale as I can, but I want to make the micron marker for this picture. Okay, and I know the mag because my instrument either told me or on an optical microscope, I know the magnification of all the lenses. Okay, so let's just say my objective is 25x eyepiece is a whopping 250x. So I draw a one centimeter line. Okay. And this one centimeter, so let's just say this is one centimeter. I didn't honestly measure it, but I eyeballed it pretty close, I think. Um, so one centimeter now equals one over 50 times 10 to the fourth microns, okay? And so this late hour, so one divided by 50 times 10 to the four is 200. So I measured this to be one centimeter. It's 200 microns. Okay, so kind of a little um, blast from my past. If you look at all my handmade micrographs, so this doesn't, it's actually kind of close. Um, this isn't the original picture, so I've skewed it, but the original picture was a centimeter. So all of my handmade micrographs were in real space or real, to, real life, um, one centimeter long. And so they each corresponded to some other number. So in this case, one centimeter corresponds to 0 0.2 microns. And why didn't I say 200 nanometers? Uh, because in my day, nanometers weren't really used that much as a dimensional reference. Um, it was either microns or angstroms. And uh, so just some trivia there. Um, so hopefully this has been informative. And uh, we'll do some more exercises um, using dimensional references and making our own. Um, I'll put together kind of an image J uh, tutorial, or maybe I'll find some. I'm sure someone's made it online, but I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that. I'll put something out related to using image J. It's a very powerful software. Um, I trust PowerPoint. And uh, here's an example of how to calculate a micron marker. So you have to know the magnification. So that's very important because you have to know your um, equipment very well. Um, anyway, good versus better versus bad in terms of dimensional reference. And so this is a good. And it's good because I actually printed this on a piece of paper made sure this was one centimeter. I actually used um, a high dollar mid to Toyo uh, digital caliper to make sure this was actually one centimeter. And um, I put it at the same plane as what I was taking a picture of. Okay, so I knew darn well that it was one centimeter and that's pretty good. Um, it's not the best because it actually takes up a lot of space on the picture. And so what I did was I used the real one, uh, drew a line digitally, probably using PowerPoint, and I made a digital analog of uh, the, um, I still call them micron markers, but dimensional reference. Okay, so I think this is better because it's, it's more tight, looks nice. So use the real reference to make a digital version. Um, this is horrible, okay? And, and this I found in like a published paper and why is it horrible? Well, I have three keyboards here in this office and not all of them have the same key size. And uh, what, what if this was an old Blackberry? 
You know what I mean? What if this was like a prank keyboard that was like those giant calculators you can get at the dollar store or whatever? So that's a bad, this is bad. Anyway, so hopefully um, this enlightens you in a little bit in the area of dimensional referencing if you uh, didn't already know. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, again, be on the lookout for uh, something related to using image J. And if you have any questions about making dimensional references, uh, please let me know. And uh, kind of a foreshadow, I guess, um, we'll be doing a lot uh, with using dimensional references to figure stuff out. And uh, so thank you very much. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.